So I'm going to read tonight a bit from the novel I've been working on uh, for the last eight years. It's almost done. Um, and I'm reading from it because it is, I was thinking about this, it is essentially a book about why there are words and why there is art and uh, how even time can't break the connections that they make for us. Um, so this novel is called The Fayum Portraits and it's got two parallel narratives. One is set in 70 AD in Roman-occupied Egypt um, and that's a time of war and political upheaval and at that moment a, a young mother had her portrait painted in preparation for her death and she also has her baby daughter's portrait painted at the same time and these portraits, if you're not familiar with them, they're called the Fayum portraits because that's the area of Egypt where they were found in the 19th century. Um, they're not like what you expect Egyptian art to look like, not that stylized King Tut kind of art. They're, these are very realistic portraits um, of people you feel like you would recognize on the street. And they were only done for about 300 years until the rise of Christianity. Um, and they were done so that um, they were to more memorial, memorialize individual lives and to give the spirit of those people a chance to attain immortality. If, if all of the various parts of their spirit could find them again, they would be immortal. But the interesting thing is that these portraits were never expected to be seen. They were put on the mummies and then they were buried and they were not intended to ever be seen by anyone again. So it's a complete fluke that we see them now. And in fact, they're the oldest examples of ancient portraiture that we have extant. Um, in any case, the second narrative of this novel that I'm writing is about a San Francisco librarian who had a critical moment in her life. She was a single mother and uh, of a teenage daughter. Um, she sees some of these portraits, the portrait of the young mother and her baby in a book, and decides to go to Egypt to, to really see them, to see them in person for herself. And she goes during the summer of, my, of 2004, which is also a summer of a time of war and political upheaval for this country and for the Middle East. Um, so the scene I'm going to read um, Eve, the librarian, has just arrived in Cairo at 3 o'clock in the morning. And because her hotel isn't going to open for several hours, her tourist escort has basically left her at this historic souk, the Khan al-Khalili, to wait for hours until her hotel will open. Um, and she has gotten lost in the labyrinth of this enormous historic bazaar. Al-Hussein is the mosque the very famous mosque that's right next to the Khan al-Khalili. And Ahmad is the name of the tourist escort who picked her up uh, at the airport. And Yael is Eve's friend and co-worker in San Francisco. And Phoebe is Eve's teenage daughter. She lurches down the narrow alley, yanking her suitcase forward, trying to seem as though she's not hurrying through the dark, not afraid, heading for the lights of what she hopes is the square. Next to Al Hussein's high, crenulated wall, a merchant has stacked cages of restless, lithe animals in the dark, their tails brushing the wire bars, their eyes glowing as they hiss and turn. Draped over lines tied against the wall are animal hides and furs, and atop the cages, more animals taxidermied, stiffly posed and grimacing, their glass eyes soulless. Eve has no idea what any of them were or what they might have been. Madam, you like? The merchant beckons, gripping her elbow as she tries to pass and running the fingers of his other hand through the fur of a hide. Tawny, long-legged, and small, it had been some kind of antelope or deer, maybe. Very rare, the merchant says under his breath, stroking the dense, snapped fur. Dorcas gazelle, he says, almost whispering. A finger held conspiratorially to his lips. Eve feels his warm, tobacco-pungent breath on her face. He has her by the arm. She does not want to be uncivil. She does not want to seem 
a dismissive American. She does not feel she can pull away. His fingers are curled around her elbow, inching up her arm. He is standing too close, leaning into her. You will not find this anywhere. And this one, he says, running his fingers over the white spot striping either side of the spine, this one is especially rare. Maybe a week, maybe two weeks old. I'd give you very good price, he breathes into her face, pulling her elbow toward himself, pressing the tip of her elbow into his taut belly. Eve shakes her head, tugging her arm free, afraid to try out the Arabic for no, for no thank you, afraid to be rude, to be laughed at, afraid to look at her watch again to see how much longer she will be stuck here in this Egypt she didn't expect, that she had not prepared for. She yanks her suitcase forward. How much you want to pay? The merchant hisses after her. At the closest cafe, across from Al Hussein, she maneuvers her suitcase around several parties of men smoking water pipes and sits down at a table in the glaring light of the kitchen. She unpeels her carry-ons and dumps them onto the chair next to her. A waiter appears as she is feeling in her purse for her wallet, realizing she paid no attention to Ahmad's patient explanation of the monetary system. Why did she read poetry in Lawrence Durrell for 17 hours on the plane? Why didn't she study the guidebooks? Asya Tishrabi Shisha? The waiter asks. You can't understand anything he is saying. Shokram, she answers hesitantly, nodding her head. Shainana? Awa? He asks. Seeing her blank look, he says, Tea? Yes, Shokram, she answers. Sukramas boot? Eve smiles wanly and shrugs. I'm sorry, she says. The waiter nods and leaves. She summons the bravado to look around, first at the relatively empty plaza, a balloon man standing on the bottom step of the mosque's entrance. No children crowded around him now, just standing alone, waiting, twisting balloons into a shape. The men at the tables near her own meet her eyes, but quickly look away, rejoining their attention to their own lingering parties. She can smell now the sickeningly sweet odor of their water pipes, the smoke drifting thick around her. She can't get up and move. It would be too obvious, a cultural snub. They poisoned her first. A round of radiation in combination with chemotherapy, or the chemo might not have worked. She couldn't eat. Everything tasted like aluminum foil, her mouth like it was coated in ash. Yael came over with her hair clippers and a bag from a beauty supply store and shaved her head. You have choices, the counselors had said, their tone emphatic with the illusion of personal empowerment they'd been taught to impart to the panicked patients they counseled, as if either of the choices were desirable. You can watch it fall out, clumps on your pillow every morning, or you can simply cut it off. Eve wanted it over as fast as possible. Yael's eyes had pooled, but she didn't flinch, her eyes steady on the clipper. Phoebe was sobbing. Everyone was crying but Eve, who stared into the mirror at the inch-wide swaths of her hair falling away in winding coils. For a while, she fooled herself, thinking that would be it. It would be over. She wouldn't have to have the surgery, or maybe only part of it. She'd just turned 40. She'd sacrificed her hair, the long brown curls that framed her face with faint wisps of gold in summer, the one physical attribute she was vain about. She'd given them up. She'd get to keep something. But that was irrational, a fantasy. Her ovaries were already dead from the radiation. They took it all. They got it all. That's what the doctors kept saying, their relief undisguised. But that was it the point where negotiation, however senseless, broke down. They'd taken it all. They'd left her with nothing. After the surgery, she was so flat she couldn't get out of bed for weeks. Every day after school, whichever eighth grade mom was driving Phoebe home would stop by the smoothie shop on the way. Evie said it was, Eve said it was the thing that sounded most appealing, something cool, but really, it was all she could keep down. One of the mothers told her later of the afternoon they watched the smoothie guy turn his face away from the blender to sneeze, 
then wipe his nose on the back of his hand and continue to jiggle the blender. When he poured the smoothie into a cup and slid it toward Phoebe over the counter, Phoebe leaned toward him, her face twisted with outrage. That's for my mother, she'd said in a menacing voice. You're going to dump that out and you're going to make another one, but first you're going to wash your hands. Shalkran, thank you. The first word of the quick lesson in Arabic that Ahmad had given during the ride into Cairo from the airport. Eve had written down the words and meanings frantically in the dark of the van, no idea how to spell anything, scribbling all over the inside of the cover of her book of Sappho. La, no. Iwa or Naam, yes. Minfadalak, please, if talking to a man. Minfadalik, if to a woman. Lausamat, excuse me. Sabah al Khair, good morning. Yom Sait, good day. Anamid Asifa, I'm sorry, forgive me. Mamkin Tisadini, can you help me? Insha'Allah, God willing. Insha'Allah. Egyptians say it all the time, Ahmad had told her. If you say, see you soon, your friend will say, Insha'Allah. The waiter returns, carrying a water pipe, which he sets on the ground beside Eve's table. It is a gaudy, monstrous thing. Two feet tall, with a bulbous red blown glass base filigreed with gold designs, an ornate brass pipe stem, and a corded silver hose wound round with blue threads. The waiter holds a small metal tray on which a few chunks of burning charcoal are pulsing white at their edges. He lifts them one by one with a pair of tongs and places them on the brass plate under the foil-lined bowl of the pipe. Shisha, that was the word for water pipe. That's what the, wa uh, the waiter had said, Eve realizes. She'd agreed, she'd ordered it. <laughs> Another waiter comes with a tray, setting down on the table a tiny teaspoon, a small metal bowl of coarsely granulated sugar, and a clear glass of water just past boiling, on the surface of which float whole leaves of fresh mint. He expertly scoops several spoonfuls of sugar into the glass, and gives it a quick stir before walking away, tapping the empty tray against his pant leg. The mint swirls around and around in the glass. Topa okay? The first waiter asks. Okay, Eve says helplessly, again not knowing what she's agreed to. She watches, unable to bring herself to stop him, as the waiter takes a wad of tobacco from a small cardboard box and inserts it into the shisha's clay bowl. Lifting the end of the pipe's corded hose to his mouth, he sucks in his breath and exhales a puff of smoke. Raising his eyebrows, he glances at Eve. It's a demonstration. Yes, I see. Thank you, Eve says. Chakram. She adds quickly, hoping he'll go away. But he stands there holding the pipe out to her, waiting. She takes the offered pipe, a limp silver snake with a wooden filter, glancing again at the other tables. There are a few women here and there, but only the men are smoking. How to cover for herself, how to say, I'm so sorry, I didn't realize. I'm a woman, I have cancer, I can't smoke. Anamid Asifa, I'm so sorry, forgive me. The waiter is waiting. Eve lifts the pipe to her lips and breathes shallowly in, holding the smoke in her mouth. Everything about it is awful, the smoke harsh and cloying, sweet in an acrid, nauseating way. It tastes artificially of apple. Remember the raspberryum, as she liked to call it, raspberry-flavored barium they gave you before CT scans? It was a thin disguise. It didn't fool anyone. Who does she think she is fooling? She is worse at protecting herself than an eighth grader. Good, the waiter asked without a smile. Yes, Eve says, suppressing the need to cough violently. The waiter disappears. She doesn't know how to put the fire out, so she just sets the pipe aside. Fearing that the people at the other tables are watching, amused or offended, she does not know which it will be. She can't resist the urge to look up. No one meets her gaze. The people around her are occupied with their own companions, their own conversation. Do you want me to join you? Ahmad had asked before he left her at the curb, squatting in the open van door and looking out at her with concern, one hand wrapped around the safety strap, lifting the other to his throat. 
and starting to loosen his tie. That gesture alone had unnerved her more than the thought of being left by herself. No, no thank you, Chaperon, you had answered, standing uneasily on the sidewalk with her suitcase. You're right, she'd said. I'll be fine, she'd said, unconvinced.